we're going to explore three levels of parsing in Rust, from beginner to intermediate to advanced, using the non-parsing crate. The beginner level might be written by somebody who hasn't had a lot of Rust experience yet, and we'll use that as our base to refactor to the intermediate level, covering the changes in mental model that you can transfer to your own project. Finally, we'll show the advanced way to handle the parsing, which is hard for some people to get to even with a lot of experience. Okay, so in software, there are soft line breaks and there are hard line breaks. Soft line breaks are word wrapping. They don't affect the source material. So if you have a file that is shown in your editor, for example, with soft line breaks, you will have one line be wrapped around so that you can actually read the whole thing without, you know, scrolling five miles to the right. This is often what happens on websites or, you know, uh, in Markdown because wrapping lines of text or prose doesn't change the meaning of what's being shown or said or processed. Other formats like code rely on harder line breaks. So you actually hit enter, you create a new line and then you start typing. This is because often white space matters in code and you also don't want to read something that is, you know, wider than your editor width. You can also use hard line breaks in formats like Markdown. Markdown will then of course go on to ignore those line breaks, creating a single paragraph from a series of hard broken lines. So a single paragraph in Markdown can be written on one single line and soft wrapped visually in your editor for display purposes, or it can be hard wrapped in the source file on multiple lines, which the Markdown parser will then change into a single line when you parse and render it. But why do we care about hard line breaks? Well, they give us the opportunity to write Rust at a series of different levels. Here's the example we'll be using. We have two paragraphs with hard line breaks at column 80. You can contrast that with what the same text looks like if it's soft wrapped in an editor. When we render out this text, we're gonna wanna render it out as a single cohesive unit, that is one paragraph, which means taking apart each of the extra new lines on the end of each line. So overall, we need to parse each paragraph as well as each line into that paragraph. A beginner's code might look like this. This code works and wouldn't be out of place in somebody's early Rust program. We start by setting up mutable variables for a vec of strings and an index. Then we use a for loop to iterate over each line of the input using lines, which is a function on string slices. This is basically like splitting the input on new lines. Inside of that for loop, we have three potential operations. If the line is an empty string, then we must be at the double new line section between paragraphs. So we increment our index to keep track of where we are. Otherwise, if there's a string that already exists at our index, we get mutable access to it and push a space and the content of the line onto the already existing string. Finally, if we haven't done anything else, we push the contents of the line onto the vec as a new string. After all of that, our vec contains our paragraphs and we can return that from the function. But this approach contains a number of different improvements we can make to it, especially the reliance on indices as well as the reliance on sort of global mutable state. The first change we make, however, will be quite small. Instead of testing to see if the line is equal to empty string, we can use the isEmpty function. isEmpty better conveys our intent here using human readable words and removes our ability to create problems for ourselves by typoing the string that we're trying to test against. We can also get rid of the index-based vec access entirely. If there's any empty line, that must mean we're starting a new paragraph, so push a string into the paragraph's vec. Otherwise, we can use last mute to always access the last item in the vec. There are a number of different ways to take advantage of the optional return value last mute gives us. But in this case, we'll stick to keeping largely the same control flow we just had and testing to see if the string is empty or not. If it's not an empty string, then add a space before inserting the line itself. Finally, we can push the line onto the vec if neither of the other tests pass. It's interesting at this point to note that we can remove the final branch entirely in favor of starting our iteration with a string already in the vec. We still have some free mutation or more global mutation than we actually need. And while this is fine and a very common way to write something like this, in other languages especially, we've already started writing what is effectively a fold. So let's continue down that path. This is where we start getting into the intermediate code. Our input can be trimmed and turned into lines like before, but instead of using a for loop, we can take advantage of Rust's iterators and use fold. You might know fold as reduce in other languages. We use fold on our iterator, starting with the same initial value we had earlier, a vec with a string. The initial value is used as the first argument to our closure, which accepts the accumulated data we're building up as well as the next item to process. This logic is very much like our for loop, except we've removed that extra sort of more global mutation in favor of a localized mutation that doesn't exceed the bounds of where we're operating on it. We take advantage of last and last mute instead of index access and is empty like we discussed earlier. Now a fold takes many values like the many values in our iterator and turns that into a singular data structure or something we've accumulated into. In this case, we're accumulating into a vec, which itself contains many items 
items, but we're focusing for now on the fact that we're returning a single vec. So this fold returns our vec of strings, and we can use that as the return value of our function because Rust is expression-based. There's still more we can do here. The last function returns an optional type, which we're testing to see if it's empty. And while using unwrap is a really common way for beginners to get around dealing with data inside of enums, we can use a different function here. If we go to the option docs, we can find a function called isSumEnd, which tests to see if the option is a sum variant and that the value inside also passes a test. Since we already know that accumulator.last succeeded, we can unwrap last mute inside of that branch without worrying about unwrap panicking, since we just had to access it to enter this branch in the first place. And finally, we'll also leave the unwraps in the last branch because we already set up in a way that there will always be a last item in the accumulator. Remember, we're starting with a string in the first place, so there's always at least one item, and we never remove items, so last will always give us a value, and we can then unwrap. If there isn't a last item, then our assumptions about how our program is supposed to be operating are invalid, which means that panicking is appropriate in that scenario. However, we do build up strings gradually by pushing onto them in the solution. This could, for large paragraphs, trigger our string to constantly expand the amount of space it takes up, which may or may not matter to us depending on what kind of program we're writing. We can use nom to build up a parser instead. Using nom, of course, will make the function signature change because we're using the i result, which comes from nom's crate, rather than a regular result. This is because nom is a parser combinator library, which relies on combining smaller parsers or functions, as parsers are just regular functions, to make bigger parsers. And to do that, you really want these function signatures to be kind of similar. It's easier to work with something that takes a string slice as an input and the same result with an error value as an output than it is for these values in the types to change all over the place. We'll start by using nom to handle creating our lines. Our input is effectively a separated list separated by new lines. This gives us the ability to continue using our previous logic to take those lines and create paragraphs from them. This is actually not much different than just calling lines. But as we move into the advanced example, you'll see our code advance as well. And fold, while being the most general function to do a many item to single item transformation, that doesn't make it the best option. In the iter tools crate, we have a number of different functions that we can use that extend the ability of iterators to do different things. In this case, we're going to use group by. Group by allows us to group consecutive elements in our iterator according to some test. In this case, we have a sequence of content followed by an empty string separating the two paragraphs, followed by more lines of content for the second paragraph. If we test the line for is empty, then we'll get the content grouped together, separated by groups of the new lines. That is, our test must group anything with a line length greater than zero together, and then anything with a line length of zero also together. So we end up with content, space, content. We can then iterate over these groups and join each of them together to create a string. This creates the allocation for creating that final string once, rather than creating a string and then pushing onto it potentially many times like we were doing previously. We can then filter out all of the empty lines and we have our paragraphs. Similarly to the way that we replaced fold with group by, there are actually many different ways that you can use different iterator functions to replace fold or group by. Another possible function to use from the iter tools crate is coalesce, which determines whether or not to merge any two consecutive elements in our iterator. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this example, but can you figure out why we need to map over each of the elements to create strings from them? If you can, leave your answer in the comments. Of course, coalesce, group by, and fold are not the only options. There's even more, like batching. In this approach, we take advantage of take while, not, and then some. All of these are fine. They don't necessarily use nom to its fullest potential. We said before that nom is a parser combinator library. This means we can build up complicated parsers from smaller, simpler parsers. The key insight then for our hard break paragraphs parser is that we effectively have a list of lines to define each of the paragraphs, as well as a list of paragraphs separated by two new lines. We'll need to take special care to make sure that the new line and double new line separators don't overlap when we're writing our parser. We wouldn't want our paragraph parser to run into our double new lines. And because these characters are so similar, we just have to pay a little bit extra attention. Our first parser is easy enough. It's a list of paragraphs separated by a double new line, which means that we can use a separated list with a double new line as the separator. We insert paragraphs as the second parser here for the content because we're about to write that. This is what it means to have parser combinators. Paragraphs then 
is going to be another parser that defines what a paragraph is. The second parser then is a bit tougher. We need to parse a paragraph, but also stop if we hit two new lines in a row so that we can pass control back to the hard break paragraphs parser. If we wrote a separated list like this and just use a single new line, it would work for a single paragraph, but it wouldn't stop at the first paragraph. Having a new line as a separator and two new lines as the other separator means that if we write a parser that just uses new lines, then it can eat all of the new lines and we'll never get a second paragraph because our paragraphs parser will just keep eating lines. So instead, we need our separator for the paragraphs parser to have a concept of when it should stop or in non-parlance when it should fail. Again, our separator is a new line, extremely crucially, not if a new line follows it. We can achieve this by using not new line chained together with a tuple combinator. Not new line is another example of combining parsers together to get a different result. So our parser starts at hard break paragraphs and tries to parse its first paragraph due to our separated list. The first paragraph parser tries to parse a string that is as long as possible, but doesn't include a line ending. Then tries to parse the separator, which is strictly a single new line before parsing yet another line. If the separator parser hits a double new line, the paragraph parser stops and returns what it has, at which point the hard break paragraphs parser parses its separator, the two new lines, before trying to parse another paragraph. All of this gives us a vec of vec of string slices, which we can then iterate over to join the paragraphs together with a space, giving us our final vec of strings. But it's not over yet. Advanced NOM users will come to find out that you can map over parsers themselves using the parser trait. This means that we don't need to reach into the data structure that we've created to do that iteration we just did. We can instead map over the result of the paragraph parser and do our lines join on just what the paragraph parser gives us back. And at long last, we get to the final NOM parsers. Two separated lists with very little extra code that only allocates a string when it needs to and only does it once for each string. All of the code in this video works and all of it would probably be fine in your application. Sometimes the differences matter and most of the time they don't. If you need a certain kind of performance, whether that's related to the amount of space you're using or the time it's taking, make sure that you measure first and then make changes. It's up to you how far you wanna go. In the meantime, why not learn some more Rust with this video and consider how you can remove error-prone code in your own programs. I'll see you next time.